you're ready, I can press record <coughs> and hand over to you. Sure, I'm ready. Awesome. Okay, then. Well, everybody, please go to your emoji menu and find the applause um, button <laughs> and give Paul the warmest OER20 mm. virtual welcome that we can. So I hope oh. you're seeing the taps in the chat. And Paul, take it away. Sure. Well, hello, everyone. And um, so great to be part of OER20. Congratulations to the organizers for the pivot and successfully transitioning to an online event. Um, and also, I, <clears throat> I want to acknowledge the, the quilt um, and those who have been so active in creating it. I think that's a very important symbolic um, piece of work, especially at this particular t moment in time when care is such an important topic. <clears throat> um, so my session is uh, it was about looking at open education from a kind of reflective perspective. and um, and I wanted to take this little bit of time to share with you some of the thinking that I've been doing around how we conceptualize open education and whether we think of it as a market good, a public good, or a commons good. And, and that kind of phrasing and, and terminology um, actually comes from uh, some work that I did when I was still at Creative Commons, where with a colleague, Sarah Pearson, we co-wrote a book that explored what we called open business models, which is, you know, how do you sustain your open education initiative over time? And in that work, we explored thinking about openness, whether it's in education or other sectors, as, as being um, influenced at the very least, if not directly affected by perspectives of whether or not the activity involved with openness was something that was primarily of the market, something that was uh, alternatively primarily uh, something that the government funded and became a public good <clears throat> or the state as, as you can see in this picture or or was it actually a commons activity and um, i wanted to do today's session as an interactive one so you won't be listening to me uh, show a whole ton of slides instead what i want to do is is actually um, uh, highlight some of the ways in which we could frame thinking about open education in those three categories. But I also want to allude to the most recently adopted recommendation by UNESCO, the OER recommendation, which was adopted back in November. Um, that recommendation has a series of action areas in it, and I've highlighted four of them here on this particular slide, policy, capacity building, inclusive, equitable access, and sustainable models. And um, it's related to sustainable models that today's little webinar is, is <clears throat> primarily focused on. And, and um, it, we had a, at the beginning of March, I convened a small group of um, organizations working in open education, and we were exploring the work that each of us is doing related to the UNESCO OER recommendation. And out of that, it became apparent that all of us are doing a lot of work in capacity building and uh, sometimes considerable work in policy and inclusive, equitable access. But very few of us were doing much work exploring what constitutes sustainable models. And so I thought, as part of OER 20, <clears throat> it'd be fun to kind of um, not figure that out, <laughs> but at least explore it. And so, um, so I, I actually have put together um, this this as a starting point. Um, down the left-hand column in green are a set of questions, and then to the right are three columns, one for market, one for public, and one for commons, that would allow us to explore uh, answers to those questions that uh, situate open education in one of those three ways. And so uh, let me actually uh, give this link. I'm just going to paste this link right here into chat. Um, Marin, can you can you paste that link into? Oh, there we go. 
Thank you. Yeah, okay, you came through. Um, so I want to encourage you all to go and have a uh, click on the link that I've provided in chat, and that will take you to a, um, a Google Doc that actually is something any of you can um, uh, now use yourself. You can, you're welcome to make a copy of it. And, and uh, what I'd like to do is invite you all to pick one of the questions that are in the left-hand side and um, and then um, uh, what I'd like to do is kind of unpack the potential answers to that question as it pertains to whether the activity might be thought of as being something done by the market, done uh, and paid for by government, let's say, and or alternatively, the third option, done as a commons activity. Um, on, on the document um, that I, I've shared, you'll see that there's a kind of blank um, table that, uh, again, all of you are kind of free to kind of fill in for your for yourself, for your own purposes. But below that, if you scroll below that, I've kind of created um, my starting answers to some of the ways in which we might conceive of these activities as being one of those three things, a market, public, or commons-like activity. So uh, I wanted to do this session as a, as really a form of discussion and a invitation for us to jointly explore that as opposed to me simply presenting my my own set views um, and i wanted to invite participants to first pick which pick a question um, uh, from the green column or from the very left hand side that you'd like to explore first um, once we've picked a question i'm happy to share my views but then i'm also interested in people's uh, own ideas on how we might conceive of open education in this way. The last thing I'll say then before we kind of get underway with that is, is that the reason I'm kind of proposing that we think about the activity of open education in these three forms is because if we think about how we're going to sustain open education and bake it into um, kind of normal activities for uh, for ongoing education work, then we have to figure out how to develop a sustainable model around it. And as I speak to people about sustainable models, it's clear that we all have a different conception of how it should be funded and supported over time. And some of people's views are based on the understanding that it's uh, actually uh, a a government activity that needs to be funded by publicly for by public taxpayers' money. Others believe that the, the marketplace and the big vendors are going to play a significant role in open education. And there's still others that think of it still in the in the kind of open, uh, fully open format of being something sustained by the community and done as a commons. So, um, so um, as a place to start, let me invite people to um, to pick a pick a pick a particular question um, and we can start having a conversation hey Paul that looks really great and I can see lots of people posting mm -hmm. things in the Google Doc already um, I've got it up here on my screen would you like me to share my screen so that we can sure. see the editing on on the sure. on there that'd be great thank you and um, maybe then um, there's also an easier way for you to, you know, um, yeah. kind of moderate what people are picking <laughs> sure. out. Um, sure. So I'll just get that up for you now. Thank you. So it's kind of fun to see um, people putting in uh, responses in the in the in the table. Thanks so much for for adding your ideas, um, Marin. Too, I think it's it'd be fun to actually hear people express some of these things verbally. So if anyone wants to, um, certainly we can hand you the mic if you'd like to speak to some of the things that you're entering. Um, Absolutely, please raise your hand, and then we can give you the mic. Sure. And it looks like, I mean, actually, there's activity happening all over that table. Um, but let me let me kind of, um, again, invite you all to kind of ask for the mic and share some of your thoughts, but, but also to kind of uh, jump in and kind of reflect on some of the things I see entered into the table already. 
Um, even with the first one, the first question around who's responsible for creating and iterating open education resources, um, this is an example of a really critical question. And you can see even in your answers, the, dis the disparate views of who would be responsible for that. If it's the market, the publishers and entrepreneurs, if it's public, then we have higher education institutions, the government, K-12, even teachers themselves and students and learners being involved, which I think is very fascinating. And I think a significant difference in terms of who the players are. So if we're thinking about a sustainable model for open education, then part of our decision-making ought to be who are the actual hands-on players who will be responsible for creating and managing, iterating that OER over time. And, and as you can see with the even the very first question, um, what, one point I'll raise here is that it's also a bit of a difference between uh, thinking about um, open education as an outsourced activity, which would be something that you uh, hand off to publishers, or something as an insourced activity, which is being done by the people directly involved and responsible for, in this case, education itself. Um, and alternatively, uh, for the third option, commons, then we're really thinking about not something that's outsourced or insourced, but something that's completely community sourced. Um, one of the challenges I see around conceptualizing <clears throat> open education as purely a public activity is that then we're speaking about, as has been noted by others on the table, um, the, the fact that government would be the funder of that open education activity, which is one of the primary things that's currently happening. But um, to the extent that open education is, is really thought of as a commons that would benefit everyone around the world, then it's a real challenge for governments to think about funding something that goes beyond their national boundaries. Uh, they tend to be focused on meeting the needs of their regional citizens who are the ones that have provided the tax paying money to, to fund a particular initiative. And so thinking about using public funds to support something that is of a global benefit it's not normally top of mind for governments. Paul, we've got um, uh, yeah, Mike please. Mike passed over to one of our participants. And um, I think Sheila is here in the room with us. Um, yeah, can you hear me okay? Yeah. Yeah. Oh, thanks, Paul. I, it's really just more a comment. I think this is a really interesting document, really, really useful. But I'm just wondering about this, you know, uh, creating and iterating, and maybe it's just language yeah. i think it's more about sharing and how people are using oer i think we really mm -hmm. need to think about that and you know maybe i think we've got quite a lot of policy but i think we're quite good at creating stuff mm -hmm. i think what we're not so good is using that stuff we're very good at creating <laughs> more stuff that's the same as the other yes. stuff that people mm -hmm. have created and shared openly so i think now there's maybe something in in terms of the commons and um you know, kind of people like us that are in this theory, you know, how we actually foster that. And I don't think that's about policy. I, I You know, that really goes back to practice and, and some of the things that are happening here. So that, that's just something that's been crossing my mind as I'm, I'm, I'm looking through this. Yeah, I well, I, I couldn't agree more. I think this is actually one of the biggest challenges we face right now in open education is that we have increasingly high volumes of stuff, as you put it, <clears throat> but not enough actual, um, reuse and adoption of that stuff uh, for by others and um, and this leads me to kind of think and reflect on the need to to form um, re really a kind of community around open education if I ref if I go back to the the made with Creative Commons book that uh, I co-wrote with Sarah Pearson one of the things that emerged for me was that for these models, for any of the case study models that we examined in that book to be successful, there, there's sort of three things that they did. Um, and, it, and I often reflect on that in the open education context. So here's the three things they did. They, they, they First of all, they openly licensed some very high value um, resource. The higher the value pro proposition of that resource, the more likelihood they would be successful. So first, of, of make open a very high value proposition resource. Second, they actually had a social mission. So they were 
not in the they didn't make something open and available for others for profit purposes but rather to make the world a better place and the more compelling the social mission again the more likelihood they would be uh, successful but the third piece really relates to what you were relating uh, which is that we need to actually build a community of people around these resources and that community of people can be the users it can also be the developers it can be everyone who actually has um, a need for that high value resource that's been openly licensed and the bigger that community the more likelihood that the model would be sustainable and their initiative would be sustainable over time. So you really need those three things, a high value proposition resource that's made open, a social mission, and then a large community built up around that resource. And so we've been really good at creating resources. We've been not so good about creating community around the use and iteration of those resources over time. Other comments, please. I, I would much rather this to be like that. <laughs> Anyone else want the mic? There are actually a lot of rich comments in the chat as well. Um, Paul, I'm not sure if you've seen um, Marina, Gabi, Su Ming, um, many have been commenting. So I wonder if it might be worth um, picking up a, a few of those. Sure. I'm just gonna kind of look at those now. Yeah, and, and I think Gabby's, I, so Gabby, I really like your comment too around, um, it's not about this stuff, but it's about interaction with the people who want to learn. For me, the, the open pedagogy activity currently happening in our world is one of the most exciting aspects of open education because it focuses less on the resource and more on the actual interaction. And I think that's really an exciting and important thing to take account of. <laughs> I see some people have the book. Thank you. Um, yeah. So yeah, the so just a comment on the differentiation between public public and commons in the columns. Um, this is something that Tanya has asked. Um, so th the way that I'm using those terms, Tanya, is to say that the public represents um, something that is, it would be a sustainable model for open education because government funds it. Just the way government funds public education today, we could expect government to fund open education as part of its support for education in general. Whereas the commons is something that is of benefit to everyone around the globe. So, uh, so for example, Wikipedia would be thought of as a commons um, because it does not rely on market or government funding to support its initiative as a sustainable model over time. Instead, it actually gets its support directly from donations, from, uh, from expertise and people sharing their time to manage and update that uh, that Wikipedia article or, or set of articles over time. Oh man, I'm still waking up. <laughs> My mouth isn't working right. <laughs> well, I must say, Paul, you're doing an awesome job to stimulate this discussion, which is so lively, both in the Google Doc and in um, we have at least uh, five more minutes, so um, also very conscious in case there's any other Q&A. Um, and I'm going to repost the link to the Google Doc in the chat as well, just so anybody who hasn't got it yet. Because our audience yeah, has so been growing during the session. <laughs> Everyone, yeah, it's great to see. Um, there's lots of great questions. It, it's, um, it's fascinating to think about these, uh, this, these views of open education because in, in my view at this stage, we're at this moment in time, an inflection point for open education, we're about to, uh, to potentially see significant growth around it. And so it will come down to how do we, what is our model for sustaining open education going forward? And, and there's a whole variety of uh, suggestions in the chat, um, including 
you know, what would be the role of the United Nations um, and how would the United Nations potentially itself be a funder? I think it's unlikely that we can expect something like the United Nations to fund open education around the globe. Um, and so I, I will maybe kind of um, say a couple of last things, Marin, and then uh, hand it over to you to transition us to the next session. Sure. But one of the, yeah, so one of the things that I will say is that it's probably not exclusively one or the other of these three options, market, public, and commons, but instead some kind of hybrid approach is likely to be the way that it will um, emerge as being this, the, the format for sustaining education, open education going forward. And, and even today, I would suggest that in some ways there already is some aspect of open education being some kind of hybrid of these three things. Um, I think well, that, I have to take two final questions before we end. We have sure. given a yeah, night to Sue Ming, and then we also have one final question from Kathy. So awesome. Sue and then Kathy. Uh, okay, just I'll try and make it very uh, brief. I'm just looking there at uh, Jim's comments and the, what's been going on in the chat box about the difference between uh, uh, public and commons. Mm -hmm. And, uh, you know, it seems to me uh, that how we think about public is a little has has kind of been eroded over time and we have certain assumptions about what we think public means but we don't really question those assumptions and we don't really ask ourselves where they come from so we mm -hmm. we think about public as being well the government it's something that the government pays for or the government provides and this is really uh you know a legacy of public goods theory that goes back to a period of history that we don't live in anymore, the kind of uh, uh, a New Deal, welfare state, uh, uh, government, public state that, that steps in to deal with market failures. And uh, it seems that commons, you know, we seem to be using commons more in terms of use. So if public is to do with government and provision, commons is to do with community use and maintenance. So it mm -hmm. seems that we've got a kind of like a, a, a little bit of a crack uh, opening up between uh, who's providing things and who is using and maintaining them. And part of it is to do with the fact that there's a crack that's opened up in democracy between uh, communities and government. And uh, governments uh, don't, uh, well, the public don't pay for governments anymore. <laughs> and uh, they they don't, uh, uh, governments are not used and maintained by the public in this, in the way that they might ideally be used. And I agree with you uh, very much, Paul, that it's going to be some sort of a hybrid in the future. We think of uh, um, sustainability as being the ability to meet goals. But of course, the goals are not in just in the present, but they're also in the future. So it's the uh, not compromising future generations ability to meet their goals. That's very much in the definition of sustainability. Yeah, I like so, that. So, and, and part of that is maintaining something that comes from the past and is still in the present. And I know Jim and Laura and I had said at first that we would do something about the ghost imaginary of the commons. And that ghost, I think, is very much um, uh, something that's that's persisting from the, the, the past and in, into the present. And this is ki some kind of idea of a stable knowledge. Uh, so you might say, well, we don't really think that the UN could possibly fund uh, open knowledge commons but then would we say the same thing about we don't really believe that the who should be able to fund uh, knowledge commons around public health and pandemic control mm. yeah I, I mean you've made some really great comments thank you so much um this is the kind of reflection i was hoping to to trigger and stimulate with this session and i it's just the the rich number of things being put in chat and, and on the document are really uh fantastic i i think that this kind of conversation is really important as we uh, ask ourselves how will we take the great work that we've all been doing right now and move that work forward in ways that don't just kind of reflect on the past but also invent new things going going forward and and um and finding some ways to do that and maybe the un is a way that would uh be a model for making that happen 
Um, it remains to be seen. I, I, I think even the UN, of course, gets its funding directly from its member states. And there were so many, and there was someone else, uh, Marin, that was going to speak. Yes, we have one more and the last question from sure. Kathy Esmela. Yeah, hi, it's Kathy Esler, Oklahoma State. And I really am curious about whether or not we would consider uh, open a traditional commons or an emerging commons, uh, because I think that speaks to the goals. And if our sustainability is our ability to meet our goals, the goals of a traditional commons are different from the goals of an emerging commons, right? Is that Bullier? How do you, how do you say his name? Yeah, David Bullier, yeah. Um, well, yeah, I think that... Um, it, and of course, you know, the traditional notion of a commons was primarily resourced based in, in terms of, you know, physical goods like pastures and forests and water. And now we're talking about digital things primarily. Can, and uh, relationship can, too, right? And relationship, yeah, exactly. And so, uh, th so thinking about how those constitute a different kind of commons and how the, the need to support those is, um, is of a different type. I think uh, is an important part of piece of the piece of figuring out a sustainable model. I don't have an answer, but I love the questions, and I was hoping to prompt not just answers with this session, but this kind of exploration of the questions that underlie sustainable models. So, with that, Marin, why don't I end there and say thanks so much, everyone, for participating in this session. I'm glad you found it stimulating and of interest, and I uh, love the comments that have been posted here in chat and on the document and. I hope that this is a conversation that we can continue as we explore sustainable models for open education moving forward.